can start now. There's quite a few um, attendees already um, on the platform with us. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on egg and boiler production, which is brought to you by Farmers Weekly. I'm Janine Ryan, the editor of Farmers Weekly. Uh, in this webinar, we aim to provide you with um, the information you need to begin a broiler or egg laying business. We therefore bring you experts in the fields of finance, industry and production who can shed some light on the challenges and opportunities in the poultry industry. Um, the webinar will mostly be driven by you, the attendees, so please send us your, your questions. Um, we've got questions that were sent to us before the webinar, and we'll definitely be addressing some of them as the webinar progresses. Um, but before we start, I would like all the panelists to please just introduce themselves um, by giving their names and by just stating how they fall into the poultry industry. So let's start with Ahmed. Okay. <laughs> let's start with someone else. <laughs> Dr. Abungile. Let's start with you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jenin. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Um, Abungile Balakhane, uh, General Manager for the Egg Industry of Sapa. Uh, I've joined Sapa now in 2021. It's been almost two years with Sapa. It's been a great journey. Uh, I'm with my colleagues uh, also from the board, uh, Ahmad, and also Isaac, but uh, of course they'll introduce themselves, but thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Gladys. Morning, my name is Gladys. I'm known as Nana. I'm the owner of Piso Farms. I'm the owner of Piso Farms and I run every production that goes on in the farm. We are a mixed farming farm where we do from hatchery right down to growing the broilers and the layers for eggs. Thank you. Um, Isak. I'm Isak Breitenbach. I'm the general manager for the broiler organization of SAPA, and I've been with the organization for just more than four years. And last but not least, Davi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Janine. I'm, I'm not in the, in the poultry industry. I'm in the finance industry. So we finance poultry. I'm the head of information and marketing at the FMB Agriculture and a trained agriculture economist. Okay, so um, I'm not sure where our panelist Ahmad has gone. He, I think he's probably having some technical difficulties. So he was supposed to speak first, but let's go straight then to um, Dr. Abungile just to give us an overview of the um, egg production market. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Janine. Uh, when you speak of the South African egg market uh, in terms of production, uh, we've got about uh, 27 million beds uh, that gives us, you know, eggs on a daily basis, uh, which uh, the split of it, uh, if you look uh, at the commercial side, most probably 80% to 90% of the production is uh, concentrated on the commercial sector and probably around almost 10 percent is uh, from the smallholder developing farmers and i would like to always give this uh, you know description when you talk of the broader poultry industry you've got the broilers and the layers at supper and uh, these two industries are totally different you know and it has been evident from the master plans that we have in place that the egg and the broiler industry are quite different industries as much as the chicken is the main dominant animal. It's the same as the beef and the, and the dairy industry. Those industries are also different if you look at the, you know, the, the understanding of the industries. Now, if I were to speak about the market trends and opportunities and the consumption of eggs in, in South Africa, I'm certain now uh, it's quite uh, good times for some of the egg producers in South Africa. 
why I'm saying so. It's because of the 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 response in terms of the the prices in the in the egg market that are quite good at this stage. And one of the reasons for that, uh, it's it's caused by the pain that we've also experienced uh, in the past couple of months or a year. Um, we've been heavily hit by the highly path avian influenza globally, including South Africa. Uh, we were hit by this uh, influenza since 2021, which lasted until 2022. It was a bit quiet in the beginning of the year. And as we approached the winter again, we found ourselves, you know, being hit again by the same avian influenza. And it appears now it's a different strain that we are also seeing in South Africa. And the main spread of this uh, virus is from the, I would say, the wild animals to the commercial, um, uh, I would say, layer of um, birds. And another challenge we've been having in the uh, in the in the egg market has been the the issue of the feed, uh, you know, the the, the costs of, of diesel for backup generators due to, to the constant uh, load sharing. Uh, we've seen also the prices of um, of course the the the, the fuel prices are, are are high in South Africa. So in the midst of those challenges, there were opportunities for some of the producers. Uh, quite a number of producers was uh, have been struggling or are still struggling. And we've seen a very significant number of, of producers leaving the industry, which has then also resulted, you know, in these, I'll say, shortages of, of, of supplies in the market or the strain on the supply side of, of eggs. But if you again look at the demand side uh, uh, in South Africa, uh, the consumers are responding well, although it's harsh times, you know, in South Africa in terms of the economy. We are seeing now um, eggs being one of the, I would say, most affordable animal protein sources in the market. However, even though, if you look at other countries which compete with us in terms of egg production, generally in the sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the consumption of eggs is low, probably around 20 to 40 per capita consumption. And if you zoom down to South Africa, we're sitting at around 150 uh, per capita consumption. And if you look at countries like Mexico and the Colombians, those are the countries, if you look at their economy, who, which is like similar to the South African economy, especially the, the Mexicans, those countries, their consumption has jumped 400 uh, per capita, um, especially in Mexico is the leading one, followed by Colombia. And one of our biggest, uh, I'll say, uh, strategies or objectives as an egg industry of South Africa, we would like to, to push consumption in South Africa to at least 200 uh, eggs per person in the next five to 10 years. And why we want to focus on consumption, our view is that once we're able to, to, to encourage consumption, we will be able to also uh, you know, um, cater for some of the government priorities. And of course, in a country like South Africa, you, you talk of issues of transformation. We are saying one of our best strategies is to increase consumption uh, over the next coming five years. And once we're able to push that consumption, it means we'll be opening an avenue or new opportunities also for the developing farmers uh, in, in South Africa. So what we have done as an industry to encourage consumption, we are starting, um, um, uh, uh, we'll be launching a sort of um, a campaign that will start in, in July until uh, October. And October, mid-October, it's the World Egg Day. So we'll be preparing ourselves as an industry uh, for the for the World Egg Day of this year. We will we will be partnering with the with the government, uh, you know, uh, Department of Education. Now, why uh, the Department of Education? Our view is that if you look at the next uh, purchase or consumer of eggs in South Africa, it's 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 kids who are in actual in primary schools. Those are the people who are the leaders of this country. So we want to create a culture at that level to say in the school nutrition program, if government can consider at least once a week, you know, to, to provide kids at that level with one egg a week uh, for the start or uh, for the next coming three months as, as an industry, we will be supplying eggs for free in quite a number of schools that will, uh, will identify over the country. It's for us is to create that culture to show government that if, if a kid can be given at least one egg a day, it can go far and government can 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 continue with the program but our role is just to to plant the seed we are also uh, uh, in the industry speaking of issues of um, exporting eggs probably out, outside of south africa i've mentioned in the beginning that we've got about 27 million birds uh, that gives us eggs on a daily basis 
we've agreed as an industry to say if we were to commission about 10 to 15 percent or 20 percent of the current production for the export markets what it means is that uh, if we commission that 10 or 20 percent we can easily replace it with the production that is coming from the developing farmers we are working very well or close with government under these uh, master plans and we want to take the opportunity of the Africa growth, uh, what you call this, Af Africa growth, uh, what you call this. Let me say the, the AGOA opportunities, uh, those agreements that government have uh, or has to say, if we were to be able to move eggs out of South Africa, you know, to some of the African nations, or even now that global everyone has got a challenge of, of, of eggs, uh, if we were to be able to move eggs out of South Africa, we will also create opportunities for the smallholder farmers. And another last uh, uh, strategy from the egg industry is that we have seen already, you know, during these harsh times that quite a number of commercial farmers also are, are willing to, to sell their farms. Um, what we have decided as an industry was to say, if we see an opportunity of a white commercial farmer who's willing to, to sell or who's in the market, would like that farmer to be replaced by a black producer in the near future. And we've seen uh, from the government uh, funds like the, the Blended Finance and the Land Bank and the IDC Blended Finance, we, we, we are trying to convince government to say, use those final funding mechanisms uh, you know, to the best you know, use and also to achieve your objectives by working closer with us as an industry so that we substitute you know, uh, those farms or that production with the black producers. We're doing well uh, with, with government in some of the areas uh, around these master plans. Uh, in terms of technology, we've got a PEC station that we are building in the Western area uh, around Kruger Stop, which is the partnership between us as an industry and government. Um, the PEC station is not yet, it's uh, uh, fully commissioned, but it, it's, it's almost there. One of the great things that is coming from that pack station is what is the machine, the grader that is coming. It's one of, of, of its kind. It's a unique one that is coming to South Africa. And why I'm saying it's a unique one, with that uh, grading machine, we will be able now to even print for, one, for each and every egg that is graded there. We'll be able to put, to put a code to trace that egg, where it came from, from which farm. If, if that egg goes to the, let's say, to the trade, and there's a fault with that egg, it could be easy for us to scan you know, a certain code that will be put in that egg and it will give us the whole information, the farm, the date which was laid and all that. And then we can even even write the name on, on each and every egg that will be graded in that pack station. So it's one of the great technologies that we'll be introducing in the market. I think that's where I can, I'll open the, the floor on my side to, with regards to the egg industry. Jenny. Thank you, Abungile. Um, I just want to ask why um, why you think air consumption is so low in Africa compared with other places in the world? Yeah, uh, what what we are seeing uh, it's uh, uh, let's to start with South Africa also. Um, we've got other protein sources that uh, you know compete with with the eggs in the market or say animal protein sources. So what we are seeing uh, in some part of, of Africa. Uh, there's there's more preference of other sources of of protein. Uh, um, uh, let's say countries like um, uh, Swaziland, we've seen that uh, or we note that they 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 like things like the beans, you know, the sugar beans and all that uh, stuff. Uh, so it's always the competition and and also the the understanding of uh, different cultures, if I can say, the the and different uh, priorities in, in in the consumers and also the affordability. But what shocked us again in the, in the midst of all this, what we are seeing in South Africa, there are certain cultures uh, where we find out uh, they're still having view, different views in terms of uh, an egg itself. Um, I must say um, there's a certain uh, or certain cultures who believe that if, if young ladies consume eggs here in South Africa, you know, they could, the eggs could even affect the, the fertility of the, of the young ladies. So in some villages, that it shocked us that uh, young ladies are sexually disadvantaged, are not allowed to consume eggs. What we have done as an industry, you know, to find out those facts, we have uh, commissioned a study with the University of KwaZulu-Natal because 
This is happening in most of the villages around KwaZulu Natal. We have asked the University of, of KwaZulu Natal to conduct a study for us, a research, for us to understand what is actually happening, why are the young ladies in some of those villages uh, are not allowed to consume eggs. We are hoping once that uh, research uh, gives us um, some sort of uh, results, we can be able to now use those results now to sort of change perhaps or, or assist the, the attitude, you know, in terms of consumption of eggs in those areas. So it is, that those are some of the things that are, are coming or that are disadvantaging, you know, the consumption of eggs uh, generally. Of course, the issues of affordability are also, uh, you know, coming into play uh, in some of the parts of I mean, countries outside South Africa. If you look at the sub-Saharan Africa countries, probably majority of those countries, they rely on the uh, donor funding, you know. So food is a, it's a main challenge in those parts of, 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 of the world. So people, they will consume whatever is av available at their disposal in some parts of Africa. Um, and perhaps I'm jumping the gun a bit here, but um, the Agora Agreement, which is up for review, I think, um, in 2024, so that would be next year. Um, and also now, I don't know how many people are aware of the, the letter that was sent by um, US lawmakers to the White House about withdrawing South Africa from um, the Agora Summit this year. So there's some, some suggestion that um, South Africa might be withdrawn from Agora entirely. Um, does SAPA have a sort of backup plan if if they can't go ahead with this sort of export initiative of eggs um, under the Agora agreement? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, James, Janine. It, it, it is something that we are discussing uh, at the board level uh, at this stage. Um, and of course, we are, we are waiting of the outcome um, and we're hoping and whatever happens, uh, we won't be our business won't be compromised. But at, again, um, from from those such agreements, we are also banking, you know, on the I'll say the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement. Uh, if 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 such agreements are actually probably removed or moved away from South Africa, definitely trade will be affected. Um, we are hoping, and we are on a daily basis engaging with the politician, which is the government at this stage. Uh, to say, you know, whatever worst case scenario that happens, at least, you know, we need to find other avenues and the trade should not be heavily affected, you know, in whatever decision that they take on their side. But there are discussions that are in, pay, in place uh, that are happening and it's probably some of the information it's still at a confidential stage at this moment. Um, and then Abungile, I probably should have asked you this right at the beginning, uh, but just for perhaps for some attendees that may not be entirely aware, um, what is it that the South African Poultry Association actually does? Okay, no, thanks. Uh, thanks, Janine. Yeah, we more, and of course, Isaac will come in also here. Um, we, we are industry-driven association uh, where we advocate for the interest of our members uh, this stage is our members. I'm talking about both the broiler and the layer farmers. So we would more like a mouthpiece of, of those farmers. Remember now, there's about 12, let's say 200 egg farmers in South Africa. If those farmers were to, you know, approach government on issues that affect the, I mean, common issues that affect all the producers on, on issues of, uh, let's say, the policy or the, uh, the regulations, uh, you know, stuff, it will be difficult for government to listen to 200 farmers. So we are more of the mouthpiece of those farmers. And for over 100 years now, SAPA being in existence, apart from advocacy issues, we're also responsible or we always try to find solutions for the farmers, like issues of opening new markets outside South Africa, protecting you know the domestic production from issues of, uh, I don't want to say much, but Isaac is going to say that uh, issues of imports. And of course, on the egg side, we are very vigilant on what comes to South Africa and what gets to get to the market for the South African consumers. So we more of a very strategic, uh, we're a strategic organization that uh, oversees, you know, uh, speaks on behalf of the producers, uh, how we get to uh, finance up. There are two streams that we use uh, to also run our operations. 
we collect stevitar levies on the egg side, which is managed dairy for all the egg producers in South Africa. Uh, on the broiler side, they've got the voluntary levies, but uh, those are the uh, funding mechanisms that assist SAPA to, you know, to do the work that it does. We are also very active on working closer with government on issues of transformation. Um, we see that uh, this, us uh, without government or government without us, there might not be you know tangible solutions uh, you know for farmers. So we always uh, are there uh, speaking on behalf of the producers, and we also um, assist government in some of these projects that have that like the one that I've mentioned, the tech station in the West End. Uh, where we we've put a portion of funding coming from the farmers and another portion coming from the produce, I mean from the government side. So those are the things that we do, and of course the research that we do on where uh, for for the industry. So that's the work that we do. Okay, great. Thank you, Abungile. I'm sure we will have some more questions for you later on. Um, Ahmad, I see that you are back. Welcome back. Just thank you very much, Janine. Uh, my apologies. Um, the weather is very bad here, yeah? and for somehow reason we lost the signal here. Yeah? But I'm back now. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> uh, Ahmed, can you can you start your video? I uh, I don't have a video. I just want to 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 take the the panel through with my journey. I am also yeah, just, but just start your just start your video oh, so we oh, can see you. you. This, you <laughs> your <this>. camera. <laughs> okay. okay. That's me. Cool, right? thank you. There we are. We are now. Yeah. There we thank go. You. Now we can see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janine, and thank you to the to my fellow panelists and to the participants. My name is Ahmad Brankes. Um, I'm a small farmer, small scale farmer, poultry egg producer in the Western Cape. I am also a member of the of SAPA. I serve on the egg board. I have been a member of SAPA for over 12 years now. I started out there with the developing poultry farmers and then later on we joined the bigger group of SAPA. But in any rate, I can, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I can talk about, uh, specifically egg production. But I think it is uh, best if I just uh, take you through the journey, my journey, as a, how, how, how I started and where I am now. So in 2003, we bought a small holding, my wife and myself. Um, I've got <laughs> five sons and one daughter. I've got six children and they eat a lot. They like vacuum cleaners. They Everything that's wet and dry, they eat up. So, uh, one day we attended an uh, uh, agricultural fair and we saw the chickens there and I said to Wadia, look, let's buy this five chickens because the boys, they love it. So the next week, the following week afterwards, I went to buy another hundred because I now started to sell eggs to my sisters, my brothers and to everybody because a chicken lays an egg a day. And I asked the boys, are you eating eggs? They said, no, no, we're eating, but we were still eggs left twice. And I saw here's an opportunity for us to start the birds. Fast forward to where we are today. Today we have 35,000 birds. We uh, have offtake agreements with new lakes. Um, but throughout, this is a very long journey. I need to say to small farmers, this game, poultry, is not a short game. It's a long game. You need to know that from the beginning. This is not, um, you're going to buy chickens today and you're going to earn money and then you're going to be big again tomorrow. No, this is a long game. We've been in this game now for 17, 18 years now. It took me 18 years to get to 35,000 bucks. And to be a sustainable or, a, a, yeah, a sustainable small scale farmer, you need 80,000 bucks minimum. To sustain yourself so we're not even there yet after 17 years and we had we have support of the government we've we've, we've done everything so there's quite a lot of things that small farmers need to consider before they start on this journey 
Number one is you need to, it would be advantageous if you have your own property. Number two is you cannot access funding if you don't have a property. Nobody's going to help you with money. And we've, we've, we've discovered that. So, um, uh, 2007, and it, somebody knocked on the gate here, and it was an extension officer from agriculture. Guy says to me, I hear you guys are uh, having chickens. We want to help. I said, no, 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 go away. I don't want nothing to do with the government. Just just go away. Eventually, he came back again, and then we started this journey, and he took us on training, and we applied with the Department of Agriculture, and they came to the party. But uh, it is a it is a struggle with him because the uh, extension officers has got targets to meet, and you want to start a business. So for them, it's all about the targets. At any rate, so uh, long story short, our first so from the first hundred we bought, we went up to a thousand, a thousand five hundred birds. I built that shit myself in the boys. And then one morning we came into that shit and all the birds in the top layers of the cages were dead. And uh, I called the extension officer and he said they, they brought out the vets and they discovered that the birds died because of heat exhaustion, because the roof was too short, too low, and there was not enough ventilation. And then the birds died and I said, look, we're out now out of this game because we lost this 1,500. So we had to hire a bigger loader, open it up, bury the birds whilst the vets were standing there. And then I wrote the letter to the then premier and I said to him, look, this is an act of God. We couldn't help, so we have to close business. And he said, no, no, we will assist you. So they gave me another 1,500 birds. Um, that extension officer or that the uh, district manager today it's the HOT of agriculture in the Western Cape. So when we started there, we started. So we walked this journey now. So in 20, so then I said to them, look, we now want to expand our business. We want to get bigger now. We want to go to 5,000 birds. And they said, look, if you go to 5,000 birds, we need an EIA, an environmental impact assessment. Now that, my friends, that that is an expensive story, and it's a easier to takes time. So eventually, we we went for the EIA, and I said to them, "Look, I don't have money. You must pay for this EIA." So they agreed to pay for the EIA, and the EIA took two years. So for two years, we didn't have birds. We couldn't have birds. So the people come on the farm. They from the historical department. They from water. They from this. Check everything there, and then. Two years later, we got authorization to keep 12,000 birds. Big mistake, big, big, big mistake. We submitted the business plan for 12,000 birds, but later on, when we wanted to expand again, they said, no, you need to do a EIA again, because the EIA was only done for 12,000. So my first thing to small farmers is when you do an EIA, Think big, think how your, how your farm is going to be, think think big, say 300,000 birds and, and design your farm. So I always say to, 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 to if I speak to, there are two, two business plans. One is a business plan, which tells you if you take 10 chickens, you put them in a cage, you're going to get nine, nine eggs or eight eggs, that's 90% performance. But that is a simple plan. But the farm plan, that's the that's the main plan. That tells you where the gate is going to be because you need to make provision for that 30 ton truck that's going to bring food for your silos. You need to plan your dam. You need to plan your roads on the farm. All those things. So a farm plan is very, very important. So anyway, rate, so um, the EIA was granted for 12,000 and then we put up a house um, the Department of Agriculture assisted us. Once again, they uh, said, no, you will have to buy this. I said, no, 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 I don't buy this. I want that. Because at that stage, I was already a member of SAPA and 
I saw some of the commercial guys that showed me what is good cages, what is good birds, what, what, what. And the official said, oh, no, no, we have to follow procurement and we can only buy this. I said, no, then I don't want it. Don't, don't take it if you're not happy with it. So eventually they gave me what I wanted. Today, that house is more than 10 years old. I can show you that that house is still solid. It's still going to last another 30 years because we stay quite close to the sea. So corrosion and everything plays a role here. So eventually we moved up now to, to 12,000. And then I got the birds. And then I've got an off, I had an off take agreement with the company. I'm not going to mention the name. So, so this is this is what this is how it works when you when you are a new entrant. So, it's a struggle from day one till you have birds. When you have birds, um, the first big check you receive for your eggs, you got to pay your aunt. You got to pay the lady who borrow your money for diesel. You got to pay the a uh, real school fees, you've got to pay the electricity, otherwise the city's going to cut off the top. So, so all those things needs to be paid, and you have to put money away for new birds. So when you go to buy your birds, you realize, oh, I don't have money to buy my birds. So I went to this guy, the people who bought my I said, to him, listen, I, at that stage, it was 30,000 range short of birds. I said, Give me the birds, and you can take it back with Igman. He said, no, 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 no. You gotta learn, you gotta learn the art. So eventually for another two years, I was my my I had a new house, new cages, no birds because we didn't want to go. I said, no, it's fine. So at Sapa, I raised the issue with I sat on uh, one of the big boards there and I spoke to a lady there, and she was um, attached to a company called New Late Quantum. I want to mention the name. Um, so she said, "No, look, we want we will we'll take your hand and we'll help you." They gave me ten thousand birds of take agreement and got your uncle. So I'm I'm into the game again. Took my eggs. Um, part of the agreement was that ten percent of the production I will sell under my own name and. 90% goes to New Light. Couple of years down the line, uh, New Light called me in and said, look, we're very happy with, with your eggs, with the way you manage your farm. Um, would you like to expand? I said, yes, of course I would like to expand. So they gave me what is called the Enterprise Development Loan. I think Darby will tell you about how that works. So they said, Enterprise Development Loan with a, a 5%. I said, no, 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 no percent. You give me a loan, you ask me if I want to grow. You give me a loan, no interest. It was this way, that way, that way. Eventually, we agreed. We said, okay, here's the money. Put up a new house and no interest. So we built a house, a fully environmental controlled house for 25,000 birds. Um, they gave me seven million and I had to buy pay my own birds. So I borrowed the money for the birds, but it was another two point five million for that twenty five thousand birds. Today we have thirty five thousand birds with the off take agreement. I keep on saying with the off take agreement because remember, if you have ten thousand birds, you're gonna have nine and a half thousand eggs per day. What you're gonna do with those eggs? You don't have a market. We need to start with the market first. So anyway, so I've got the off-take agreement. I don't get um, top dollar for my eggs, but my eggs get sold every day. Uh, they come, the truck comes to collect the eggs on the farm. Um, they bring me plastic trays, trolleys, everything. Nice deal, nice deal. So, and this, I need to say this, I'm not selling SAPA or anything. You need to come to the table. Join SAPA, sit there, speak to the commercial farmers because they know how to do it. Uh, and they and, and believe me, those guys, they big, but they want to help. The banks, the land bank, the small bank, they don't have appetite for us. 
if you're a small farmer, Dawi, you can agree or disagree with me. They don't have appetite for us because um, it, it's a risk for them to, to invest in us um, because we don't we don't have the repayment ability. Even even though the money is that government has given to land bank to assist us, I tell you, I've never in my life fought in so much forms. Only to be told now, we can't help you. And the answer to me is, you spend too much money on infrastructure. Now, where must I put the birds? You see, people don't understand the industry. So I would suggest that the banks and the retail guys come closer to the industry and understand how it works. We are first generation farmers. To put up uh, infrastructure on, on, on a piece of land, from nothing, it's very, very expensive. But it is possible. Today it is possible because uh, Dr. Ebo and, and Isaac will tell you, he's always praising the market. And the commercial guys wants to help you. Yeah, you, you've got to knock on those doors, you've got to knock down those doors, you've got to go out there and, and ask for help. And um, the Department of Agriculture have got funds, certain funds to assist you. Go there. Don't be shy. <laughs> they might just help you. I don't take no for an answer. I say, <laughs> if you can't help me, um, okay, what other, what other way is there for me to go? I've, uh, thus far, thus far, uh, the only loan we have is the one, the, in, the enterprise development loan that we got from Quantum to build that house. We don't have any other loans. Um, because I apply to the banks for telling me no, 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 no. I've been banking with all of them now. And they see for 20 years we've been banking with them. We don't owe them. We don't own no money on buckets. We don't own money on tractors. And by the way, we also do uh, vegetable production. So, so we do mixed farming. So vegetable production, those of you know, takes longer. Your return is longer on your investment. But so the eggs help you to keep the cash flow as well. Um, Eggs any day for me over broilers, any day for me. Broilers is very intensive. You need to have a market number one. You need to have all those facilities in place to transport those birds to take you to the other tour. It's just too much. Um, yes, it can be done. I've seen broiler guys. Uh, I know, I know, I know of black broiler produced big boys, big boys. And they, they belong to Sapa. I've seen those guys starting with nothing and they, they peak today. So yeah, there is opportunities in in poultry, but it's just not a short term, it's a long term. You got to endure, you got to knock down the doors. You don't have to like me. You don't have to like the guys at Sapa. They can be sometimes very difficult, but you go there because the answers is there. If I always say to, to my two sons that works on the farm, do not buy. If you do agriculture, do not buy a, a U magazine or a Eastern. Buy a farmer's weekly. This is your grain. Stay in your lane. And because farm, farming, if you work with animals, anything can happen anytime. You can't go on holidays. Chickens don't go on holidays. <laughs> you got to be there every day, a whole day. And, um, in my, in my case, in our case, we've got two sons who, who, who are also part of the business. So, so they take one of them take care of the chickens, one of them take care of the vegetables. But we have, we we hunt as a pack. We sit every day, we talk, we plan, because we are new in this game. We don't know, but the the chances for my birds to get sick is the same as for the commercial guys to get sick. So we need to play by the rules. And SAPA is our uh, mouthpiece when it comes to those rules. And um, you will see as you grow bigger, then you will understand what is the benefits of an EIA. Why do you have to have an EIA? Because one of the things that the EIA tells you, number one is, what is the direction of your house going to be? A lot of guys put up houses and it's the wrong direction, but don't perform, um, wrong feed, a lot of things. But if you do the EIA, 
all those things will come clear for you. And Dr. Ebel and his team, they assist with EIAs through the transformation at SAPA, your local um, extension officer of the department, they should also help you. And from our side, and my, my business name is Kemo Mao Farming. We're out in Philippine, Cape Town. Anybody is around here would like to come and see what we do, you might welcome to come. I won't let you in the houses, but I'll show you around what we're doing here. And um, are we finished now? No, no, we're not finished. We're only starting now. And, um, yeah, we're here for the long run for the nice time. Yeah, so any questions, that's, that's my story. Jenny. Hello. Thank you so much, Ahmad. Um, so we will make details available for um, for the panelists uh, to the attendees. Um, I think it will probably be emailed to you. Um, so if you have any particular questions uh, that you'd like Ahmad to answer, then then you can get hold of him. Um, We'll also, as I said earlier, we will also get to some of your questions a bit later. Uh, so please keep sending them. Some of them are quite similar to others, um, but we will try and answer as many of them as possible. Um, so now we move from, from one farmer to another, Gladys. Hello. Thanks for the opportunity, Hello. guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and yes, yes, Ahmed said a whole lot. Yes, and, he did. Yes. He did. And, no, it's while he was talking, it took me a whole lot back to my own journey. But this is yeah. the thing. For anybody who wants to start farming, anyone whatsoever, the first thing is to have the passion. Because he, now he says that it's not a day or a day journey, it's a long journey. So for you to say you want to go into poultry production, my first advice is this, have passion for it. Don't do it because Mr. A seems to be making money out of it. You do not know how Mr. A started, how long it has taken Mr. A to get to where he is today. So first develop that passion. Secondly, I would say, Whatever information you can get hold of, develop a habit of hungry, being hungry for information. Do research, go out for talks, go out for uh, workshops, learn as much as you can. He mentioned diseases. Reason why you need to learn as much as you can is to know how to prevent things before they happen to you. The thirdly is this. What I've noticed also in our industry is a lot of people want to learn but they do not have the means to learn. So if we as farmers and other bigger organizations can provide means for them to get this learning, then it will make a lot easy. He started with what, 100 and he's doing 38. The same thing in the broiler industry. The broiler industry is not, you don't just jump in it and you make money in it. Pizza Farm has been in the industry for like 13 years. And within the 13 years, we've grown from one, one coop that takes about um, 1,800 to a coop that takes about 5,000. But it took a whole lot of journey. And one of the first journey it took was to learn. I traveled, I volunteered, I went into, I went to live in people's farm to work for free so that I would be able to learn from their experiences. I'll be able to learn how they are doing it. And you don't necessarily need the degree. That's another beautiful thing. You don't necessarily need a farming degree to go into poultry, but you need as much information as possible. Secondly, when you go into poultry, there are some restrictions, especially with the broilers. Broilers are very intensive. Broilers are very funny. They are very, very funny beings. And they are very sensitive to everything. So if you have to go into broilers, there are so much things you have to learn to take care of it. The management of this broiler, one of the most important thing, you need to learn it on your own. You don't just open a poultry farm and you do not know anything about poultry and you get people who think they know about poultry to run poultry for you. This is one of our mistakes that we do. 
we jump into it. I've read it even this morning. I read someone tell, telling me about uh, the workers not taking care of your workers at this point that you are a small scale farmer. Your workers don't need to run the things for you. Somehow, for you to invest your, your small amount of money into poultry, you need to be there. I am a hands on farmer. I do everything. In as much as I have workers, but I, I make sure that everything that needs to be done in the farm has to be done right. Reason for that, that's the reason I have to be there. If you go into poultry or when you do go into poultry, boil, broilers specifically, because of their sensitivities, you need to take certain steps. Let's say for instance, the biosecurities. In, I don't know if I'm allowed to use the African culture. It's not just African, it's the culture, it's the human culture. When you start something, somebody wants to come to you. People want to come and see what you're doing. People want to troop into your place. This trooping into your place, this traffic that is coming into your farms, these traffics are the reasons why most of us don't make it. An auntie would come and see what you're doing, go into your coop, go, go and visit you and take, want to take pictures and stuff. They don't know what they have brought in to your farm. So for you to know this, I would suggest do serious research, do serious learning on biosecurity, the health of your birds. Broilers are sensitive. Learn how to take care of your birds. Sometimes we don't, we can't afford um, vets and we can't take our, our birds to, to um, government vets but we need to understand the health of our birds, the symptoms, so that even before we get the, to, the bird, uh, to the vet, we must, okay, say, is this, this, is, this looks like the sign, this doesn't look like, go and learn it. Another thing that, that you as a poultry farmer need to understand when you are starting is your market. I've seen a lot of questions coming in, how much will it, uh, will it cost to start a poultry farm? It's not just how much, I've seen a lot of uh, farmers asking, how is the marketing? Before, before he went into uh, selling off takers, he was selling to neighbors. He started selling to neighbors and he started selling to the aunties. And this is how you start and you broad, you, 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 your market broadens. So before you really go into spending the little savings, a lot of us farmers started with what we have. And sometimes what you have is not just enough, but you just have to start. But before you put in all your money into something, check out the market. Who is your market? Who is your competition? How am I going to sell? Who is going to buy? And funny thing is, before you get to the off taker part, you must know how to go to them. You don't sit and wait for them to come to you. When you sit and wait for the market to come to you, you will grow your chickens and you will eat them. So learn to take your market to them. Learn to take your business to them. Make as much noise as possible to the market, be on your face kind of marketer. You don't necessarily need all the money. You don't necessarily need all the, um, all the adverts. You don't necessarily need the marketers or the advertising market uh, companies to market for you. Take them out to yourself. Another thing that, that has given us also a problem is this. Let's say commercial, let's look into commercial and the small scale. The commercial, it's easy to read theory, but it's not easy the practical part of it especially for a small scale farmer. Our business is a number game, it's a volume game. And a small scale farmer is sitting, a small scale farmer is sitting on what, 200, 500? And the commercials are going into thousands. And you, you see that they, they have a, cut, a cutoff mark of six weeks. And at six weeks, someone comes in, take them all out. But before we get to that point, let's, let's look at us with our budget. I have a budget of 5,000 to grow, what, 100 chickens? And at six weeks, that's when I'm supposed to sell. And I don't have the market that will take them all at once. I have the market that will take 10 today. That'll take maybe 15 tomorrow until I get to that part where I have off takers. What happens then when I don't finish them up at six weeks, someone takes 10, another one takes five, but I still have them to, to feed. So I take the, prof, the profit to keep them alive. That is where um, small scale farmers are struggling go out, that's the reason why our marketing, and it has to do by us. Chisanyamas, roadsides, bus stations, train stations. I'll give you a little bit of history. 
when we started, I was working. And when I was working, just like, <laughs> just like he said, he has um, uh, six children. I followed that at grade two and salary was not enough. And my husband was working, he's still working. And um, I was working, but it was not enough. But we started selling eggs. We buy from the commercial farmers and I would take them after work. I would take them by the uh, train station. Here I buy little thing. I would open my, my, uh, my backy, my, um, I was driving a smaller car. I'll open it at the boot and people coming down from the train, they'll buy a crate, two crates. That's how my own farming, my own farming started. I was working also as an animal scientist, but that's how my own farming started. And as, did, as in the long run, what I ended up doing was, I'm close to Tembisa, I'm close to Olifants, I'm close to De Desplut, I'm close to Four Ways. I ended up, I would get a baki, I would load the chickens as soon as they are five weeks and they have certain weight. Because don't forget our markets eat with their eyes, not their skill. The truth is we are, our own skill. We do this to check our, the size of our, our chickens. So our markets, the way that once they look at it, it's big enough, it can feed four people, then we are good. We load in the backy. I would go from street to street. In Tembisa, I would go from every corner before I stop in their markets where they sell chickens um, somewhere in, in Swazi Inn. And at, in a day, I would go between 200 to 400 chickens. I took the market for them. But if I never did, I would sit there with six weeks old chicken waiting for someone to come. Your marketing strategy, one of the things that is still killing a small farmer is this. We start, to grow, we start growing them. We don't tell anybody. We keep quiet. We grow them quietly until they're six weeks. Then you're waiting for someone to come and buy it. As a small scale farmer, why don't you prepare the mind of your neighbor? Prepare the mind of the people around you. Prepare the mind of people who know you, that you've started this. And this is your first set and you are growing them. And at this time, they're gonna be ready. And when they're ready this time, you will need to sell them. This, you, you put this in their head. You talk about it all the time. Some people will buy, some will not buy. But you should not be ashamed of your business. Talk about it, make noise. That's so that by the time you are ready, some people, I do that. I will have this amount of money and I'll keep it. It's okay. Gladys is growing and she's gonna grow and she's gonna be ready in five weeks time. I'd like to try her product. That's how it starts. Another thing that kills small scale farmers is cycle. I, I tell my farmers and I tell my students, keep the cycle constant. We are not yet big enough to clear up a house, clean it, leave it for 14 days before we put place another one. Create smaller coops or smaller houses. It is difficult enough when a, 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 a customer or a client come in with a 50 rand and take the chicken today. And they come in next week, you say your chickens are still growing. There are many smaller farmers around, they would go there. So you will end up breaking a cycle. If you have to build, if you're making hundred, it's fine. But give yourself a cycle of hundreds every two weeks, every week. Just have a cycle so that when one is ready and is sold off, another one is getting ready while you are cleaning. And I understand how difficult it is. I'm a big fan of starts from where you are and what you have, but make sure you start it right. He, said, he spoke about the, the positioning of the, of the coop. If you don't get it right, you will not have enough ventilation. You will not have enough sun. There's so many things that would go wrong. We spoke about the, uh, the avian influences. It's yes, it's from this migratory bread. If you do not get a right coop, and with that will prevent any form of um, strays into your poultry house, then you are in for a big ride. Let's forget about the load shading. I am, I'm not even gonna talk too much on the load shading because a lot of us rely too much on things that we can change. We can't afford the solar system. We can't afford generator. But there are so many things you can use to start up until you get to that comfortable place where you can now go seek for funds, where you can now go seek for loan, where you can now go seek for grant. But you can build yourself things. I, I tell them that when you are broke, you become creative. I've got three coops that I built with my hands and me and my husband. 
we built it ourselves. I learned to I learned to brick to do bricklaying. I learned to mix the crank, the concrete and the sand. I learned to weld. The build, the coop is still standing 11 years later, strong. No, mm, we've not built anything. We've not, um, what do you call it in English? We've not modified or fixed anything yet. Only the flooring, because the flooring of your chicken coop needs to be smooth. So we just, we just plaster it every now and then. So as small scale farmers, do not still sit and wait. Honestly, just as, um, as he said that about the, the layers, it's important to understand that when you go into this, you will not make the money. Be disciplined, because if you're not disciplined, then you will lose. I had a, a, one, one, a farmer of mine who got the, the funding and it was quite a big funding. And personally, I would feel with such funding, the sky is just the beginning. But the first thing they did was they bought trucks. They bought backies, fancy backies. They, they, they took care of themselves first before the business. How would you want the business to grow as a small scale if you start taking care of yourself? I have learned that everything that comes from your farm, be disciplined enough to put it back so that it will grow. You don't just eat your profit. No, the best thing you can do for yourself is allocate a small tiny salary just to take care of you if you can. If you cannot, put everything back. So learn to be disciplined and say, you don't need this. The farm needs this. You don't need this. The farm needs this. As long as you have, you know your purpose, you know your, what is driving you, you will be able to succeed. As people complain, load shedding, load shedding, what happens to, I've got a section in my farm where I have the small bulbs with the solar, with it's just the small solar lights for the lighting inside the farm. And at the same place, I, I build bowlers. And I learned the act of using mbala without killing my bird with the smoke. Learn those things. I, uh, I, I read about somewhere this morning also, also about abattoirs closing down and abattoirs charging, charging to rip off the small scale farmers. One thing we must understand is this, the amount of money that a small scale farmer will use to grow one chicken, one broiler, is not the same. It's actually doubled the price when it's done by the commercial. So if you are doing 10, 100, 200, I would advise keep the abattoirs aside first, get the plucking machine, learn how to do the processing yourself. There's nothing wrong in doing it the right way with the minimal cost. Then look for your market who will buy yours yet until you get there. And another thing that we need to also understand at small scale farmers. However, it's not everything that works for the commercial farmer will work for you. If you follow that strategy, you will not be able to push it because this thing takes time, takes patience. I did it for, I did it for about six years, seven, before I fully resigned from my work and concentrated on farming then started seeing a little bit of profit. I'm not seeing the profit yet, I'm just growing it. The idea is to grow it as much as I can. So you need to also understand that if it, what works for um, the commercial farm doesn't necessarily need to work totally. I mean, commercial farm, we have automated buildings, automated coops with everything installed that you don't need to open the, the side sales, you don't need to close, everything is done automatically. You as a small scale farmer, you, most of your things are done manually. So you need to be able to do these things and do it right. Not everyone, I, um, when Dr. Obongile spoke something, he said something about providing one egg per week for the student. I understand the importance of eating eggs. I understand the importance of eating chickens. And at the same place, I read somewhere also, not every family can afford these chickens. Not every family can afford these eggs. Why don't we, as those of us who are coming out now, why don't we make, create a platform where we teach them this? Teach them, teach them how to make it instead of giving them how, uh, give them one egg or one chicken a week. 
Well, I hope I gave a little bit of insight on when it comes to poultry farming. Thanks for the opportunity and bless you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. I think, um, yeah, your and Ahmed's journey, journeys have been incredible. Um, and I think there's probably quite a few questions for you. So um, we'll get to those in a bit. Um, but let's now turn to Issa. And we'll be speaking about the broiler market um, and trends, as well as a few other things. Um, Janine, thank you very much. It's certainly inspiring to listen to Gladys and to Ahmad um, on their journeys to, to get to the levels that they, that they are. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, of, uh, about the broiler industry. Um, if I give an overview of the South African broiler industry, I think the, the very first one that one need to know is that this is the second biggest industry in agriculture. It's only maize production that is slightly bigger than poultry production. We are the biggest um, industry by far in terms of animal production. Um, we're an industry that slaughtered 22 million birds per week. But we also have um, small cell scale farmers producing about 1 million birds per month. And that certainly gives us um, an idea, uh, indication of what the contribution of the small farmer is to this big economy. Uh, broiler farming is very labor intensive and we employ about 50,000 people um, in the broiler industry. And it's an industry that is very competitive. Um, it is competitive uh, over and above the fact that we've had COVID, we've had influenza, we've had very high raw material prices, um, we've had suspended anti-dumping duties, um, and we've seen the impact of, of load shedding. We are actually producing about 155,000 tons of good, safe poultry meat per month for this industry. So this is certainly an industry that a small farmer should look at and participate in. And there are various opportunities. And I'm going to reference some of these opportunities towards the end of my talk. Both the two farmers uh, that spoke, Ahmad and Gladys, <clears throat> mentioned that you please don't start broiler farming um, without a market. You need to have a market if you want to produce birds. And let me talk a little bit, uh, bit about this market. In South Africa, we tend to consume small birds. And that is caused by the fact that um, the consumer is cash strapped. And therefore, um, it would, the consumer would like to buy a meal with the money in his pocket. And that made us, over time, producing smaller and smaller chickens. Um, and, and, and this is a, a unique um, trait of our particular market. If we talk about the different products in the market, we've got IQF, that's about 50% of the market. Um, we also produce fresh birds, catering portions, bone-in and boneless portions. And within this the, this, the small farmer must think that the market is certainly a live bird market, but the market is also the informal market in the townships where people are cooking chicken products um, next to the road and selling it to, to passers-by. Um, that is an absolute market. It's a big market. And it's a market that makes a lot more money than what the big companies will do. So what we see is that um, in this market, you get more money for your product, although your cost is a little bit higher. Um, we import about 46,000 tons of poultry meat, and we survey about 400 uh, small farmers twice a year to ask about their problems. And the typical problem small farmers will, will um, mention would be things like the imports are killing us, and they will mention that um, the feed cost is high, um, and they're struggling with that. Um, the accessibility to Dale chicks will be mentioned. Um, the cost of Dale chicks will be mentioned. Um, access to capital that Darby will talk about later um, will be mentioned. Um, but within this, um, the market will also be mentioned. 
if we look at the challenges in the industry, um, it is failing infrastructure, and we talk about load shedding, um, roads, and that also impact the small farmer, and that comes up in the surveys that we do. Secondly, our price of maize and soya at present is at all-time high prices, and therefore feed prices are at all-time high prices. And I'm going to talk a little bit about feed prices, uh, having seen some of the questions um, in this webinar. And the consumer demand at the moment is low. So if you ask me about the broiler industry at present, it is actually under huge pressure. And we see a lot of small farmers closing down um, simply because the consumer can't afford the chicken and our price for chicken meat is too high. That is the short term. But if we look at the long term um, of this poultry industry, it's actually a growing industry. And the, the um, east space for a segment uh, for small farmers and for big farmers to expand into this uh, type of industry. I need to, to, to touch on technical advancements um, and innovation. We see huge uh, um, advances in, in technology. Um, if we talk about our bigger farmers, um, they will have chicken houses costing 5 million rand. Um, it will totally be totally computerized. It will be the same house as that, what you will find in America. Um, secondly, what we will find is that um, people will invest in the efficiencies and automation of abattoirs. Now, remember, again, we must not think about the big abattoirs only, but we also have smaller micro abattoirs that is managed by our smaller farmers. Those would be um, basically a 44 gallon drum with, with boiled water for uh, to take the feathers off the chicken. A, a, a pluck of, uh, of the chicken, and then a place where we just rinse off the carcass after it's been um, after it's been slaughtered, and that will be called a micro abattoir. And certainly, all of those exist within the within the um, uh, industry. If we talk about um, some uh, uh, farmer support and capacity building in the poultry industry, um, in the last uh, three years, 19 new black contract farmers were established. These are people that contract grow for companies. Those farms are typically big, 200,000 birds per farm. Um, a farm will cost about 40 million. So what I'm saying here is that there are farmers, um, bigger producers that they had previous experience and some of them worked in the poultry industry that um, ended up owning their own farm financed by IDC and private, um, private banks. But um, in SAPA, we also assisted 40 farmers with environmental impact studies and water licenses. Um, these are constraints. Once the uh, a small farmer wants to expand, um, he, he runs into the fact that he needs an environmental impact study and it costs a lot of money. And a water license that costs a lot of money. Um, what we've also done for these 40 uh, farmers, and those were small farmers to commercial scale farming, uh, was to do viability studies um, or, or business plans um, to work out whether their businesses are in fact financially viable. We've trained in the excess of a thousand producers in the last three years. Um, and, and, and that is very important because um, without the knowledge, um, you will not successfully farm chicken. Let me reference um, a case study um, and maybe two case studies of um, a broiler farmer that started in his garage where he used to park his car. Um, he put in feeders, he put in drinkers, um, and he started a poultry business. But that was not the first thing he did. The very first thing this farmer did was to find out uh, that he had a, a market for these chickens. And this particular farmer didn't slaughter. Um, he sold into the, the live market. And there was an opportunity for him to, um, uh, to, to sell these live birds at the Sasa uh, sales point. Um, and because he knew of this particular market, um, he, he placed these birds in his garage. And he grew these birds in his garage and he started selling it at the Sasa point uh, once a month um, every six weeks, he would be selling his birds there the day that the money is paid out. 
and he would sell all these birds um, at that particular point. Um, so he had a market and then put in the production uh, for these chickens. What then happened to this particular farmer was that um, he's, um, uh, the market, the Sasa point, closed down. And all of a sudden, you had a farmer with a farm full of chicken and no market. And uh, um, what he then did is that he, he looked at the taxi rank um, and decided to, to, to sell at the taxi rank. He had a second problem. The second problem was that um, he never sells all of his live birds. Some of the birds are too small and the consumers or the customers don't want them. And those birds you have to slaughter by hand and put into a freezer. And what then happened for him was that he sold these live birds um, at, the, at, at the taxi rank and, and it went well. And he expanded his business outside of the garage. Um, he put in um, another house the basic house that he built himself um, and therefore increased his production. This, the uh, point became, uh, he had a second problem. The second problem was that he now had too many birds to sell live at the taxi rank. So he tended to slaughter more and more of these birds and put them in a the fridge. What this farmer then did is that he actually put up a container at the taxi rank, um, a refrigerated container, and the day that he takes his live birds to the taxi rank, um, he also sell his frozen birds from the, from the container. And in that way, you can now see he developed his market. There's one step that I, that I didn't, um, that I didn't uh, talk about. Um, when I met this farmer, this farmer was fully informed. Um, this particular farmer um, actually went on to Google onto um, YouTube and the SAPA website, because all three of those um, uh, electronic uh, uh, places um, had a lot of um, information about poultry farming. And he could actually uh, work out exactly what he needed to do, how he needed to farm, how he needed to place birds, how he needed to feed birds um, from those sources of information. And, and that gives you some idea of a, a, a small farmer that started in his garage and eventually ended up with a business that did not only sell live birds, but also sold, um, sold frozen birds. Um, that to me, um, and that experience that we had with this particular farmer um, actually uh, tells us what the methodology is that one need to follow in terms of all of that. The first point is that we need to get all the information. And without the information, we can't farm. And we get, often get people phoning us with an idea, idea that he wants to farm chicken, or he wants to farm broilers. And that is, that is not enough. And SAPA can't help that person. But the person that phones back and he says that he has re done all his research, he knows how to grow chickens now from the research that he's done, he knows what the vaccination program looked like from the research that he's done. Um, he knows all of that. Um, that already makes it um, a farmer that, that we can assist. The second point, um, and, and that will always be my second question to a, 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 a new entrepreneur, would be, what is your market? And people will say, I've seen a market at the taxi rank, but that's not a market. Um, we, you want to know at what price you can sell your chicken at the taxi rank. And aren't there other people selling at the taxi rank? So the market answer is not yes or no. The, the answer about the market is I can sell 100 chickens um, at 70 rand a bird live um, at the taxi rank in one day. So you can three, see that there are three elements to defining the market for this upcoming uh, farmer, this entrepreneur. Um, and, and that is how it would work. Um, I've seen a question about the feed price um, on the um, webinar. And let me talk about the feed price. And the question was, how can we reduce our feed cost? Now, feed costs are simply um, the price of maize and soya and vitamins that they put into the feed. But we actually have two types of feed or several types of feed. You can have feed 
that is um, is very good and, and, and allow a bird to grow really fast, and that is expensive feed. Um, and then we can have feed that gives us a little bit of a slower growth. You can slaughter the bird or, or, or sell the live bird at six weeks of age, and that's a cheaper feed. Um, so that is one way that you can look at your business. It doesn't help you if you only want to, to sell your birds at, at 36 days to have the, the strongest feed that your money can buy because that is not your, your production process. Um, you do that if you want to slaughter birds at 31 days. You take the most expensive feed with the most nutrients in, in it. Um, but certainly, uh, in my experience, um, with uh, smaller farmers that tend to sell live specifically or slaughter a, a little bit later, you can go for a, a lower specification uh, feed. Um, Janine, um, that, that, is, that is all from me. Thank you so much, Isaac. Um, we'll definitely get back to you at <laughs> at some point. Um, Davi. Hi, uh, Janine. Thank you. Um, I hope technology works to, works with me today um, because I'm going to share a quick presentation. Can you perhaps just indicate if you can see that? Sure. Is it on, Janine? No, I don't see it. Uh, okay, I saw it. Sorry, my screen. Uh, it's coming soon. One second. And I can see it. Okay. I must just make sure that I have. Uh, I don't want to send an email. I want to do a PowerPoint. Is it visible now? Yeah, well, yeah, now it is. Okay. So, John, uh, thanks, uh, everyone. I think um, everybody before me have spoke a lot about the, the, the uh, practical things, and that's great. Thanks, Gladys and Ahmed. That was, that was really wonderful. Um, the question is, obviously, is it the chicken or is it egg? Um, or is it money? Uh, because like uh, everybody said, you need the market um, to, to, to sell your produce. So just to uh, do a quick disclaimer, um, you know, from a bank's perspective, this is not financial information and so on. I prefer to use this one. Uh, please be responsible for what you understand from what I'm going to say. So if we look at, at finances, we must obviously look at, you know, some, some basic terms uh, ratios that we that we as financiers look at, and then you know some of the financial statements that's being used uh, in the credit application process, um, and then in the end, what's happening in a in a in a in a credit process as well. So if we look at some basic terms, um, obviously you know you have your your capital and your fixed and your current assets. In the case of the poultry industry, your, your fixed and capital assets will be your, your houses and your infrastructure and so on. And your current assets will be your birds or your, your eggs in stock and so on. Equity, that's the skin that you put into the game uh, in, in terms of your own, own contributions. Liabilities, yeah, that's your creditors uh, in the end. And then we, we have to look at, at the gross value of production. And that's the easy one. That's your price times your output. So it's your egg price times the amount of eggs that you sell uh, or broilers that you produce. Your variable costs, that's obviously you know, those things that vary uh, in terms of your, uh, the, the size of your production. The more you produce, the more those costs will, will be. And that's in, in, in this scenario, feed costs, um, heating costs in, in, in the case of broilers um, and, and so on, uh, medicine and so forth. And then your fixed costs are those, those office costs, uh, cell phones or telephone and, and office variables that's uh, included there. And then if you, you subtract those two, your fixed new variable cost from your gross value of production, you get your net farm income. Um, and that's where, where credit comes in and they look at that net farm income to see uh, if that's uh, possible to, to repay some loans. 
So just a, a quick sky, uh, schematic example or, or, or outline. If you look at your X sales um, and, and that's your quantity times your price, get, you get your X sales, you can put it out per hen or per house or, or, or how you as a farmer want to do that. You get to your gross output, uh, you subtract your, your variable costs, you get your gross margin uh, and you subtract your fixed cost and then you get to your, your, end mod, your net margin in the end. And that's the, that's the profit in the end that you will make. So if you look at some ratios, your debt to asset ratio, so that's the amount of creditors that you have uh, in relation to your, the assets that you have. Anything below 40% uh, is, a, is a healthy scenario but it will vary between industries. Uh, if you look at your intensive industries, like a poultry industry, that can be more than, than 40%. Uh, if you look at, for example, fruit industries, it can go up to even 80% or, or in, in that region. For extensive livestock for farmers, for example, it will be much less than your 40%. Liquidity. Uh, that's your, your current ratio, your current assets divided by your current liabilities. Uh, and the other ratio of two, two to one is, um, is, is advisable. So you imagine that if, if you have one rent of, uh, of current liabilities, you should have at least, at least have two rent of current assets. And current assets is your, as I've said, your stock. It can be vehicles, it can be cash on hand and so on. Then profitability. Uh, your total capital, you take your net farm income as you've calculated it, times 100 divided by your average total capital. And then anything above 10% uh, is, is positive and that's in a, in a good scenario. But uh, for livestock farming, um, and that's not necessarily uh, uh, not uh, applicable to poultry, but it's normally in the region of 8%. Uh, we say to livestock farmers, if you can achieve more than 8%, you, you, you are in a good space. Then a couple of, of financial statements. Um, I'll go through each one of them now. Um, if you look, for example, at your balance sheet, that's your, your statement of your financial position at a specific date or a specific time. So it's a snapshot of your business at a specific uh, time in, in, in a year. And it's normally at the beginning uh, of the financial year or at the end. Um, and that's in, in the farming industry, it's normally uh, February. Uh, most industries or most farmers and businesses uh, falls into line with the SARS uh, uh, financial years. So the, the balance sheet's a source of information for, for us as uh, financiers to see what's your long and your short term debt. What is your gearing? So how many assets uh, or, or, or debt do you have in, in relation to your assets? What's the reserves that you have, your capital assets? And then if there's cash on hand, how much is that? And then from there, we can calculate a return on investment or a return on, on equity. If you look at an income statement, you have, you know, it's mostly your profit and loss account. So uh, that's a, a very important one. Uh, statement of income and expenses, that's your fixed and your variable costs, but it also includes your cash and non-cash non transactions like depreciation. So that's a, the difference between the, the income statement and the cash flow statement is that non-cash transactions. But not all expenses will be included in the income statement. They might be capital expenses, where let's say you put up uh, another, another house uh, that will be included in a balance sheet and not necessarily in the in income statement. And then from the, from the income statement, we, we get that EBITDA, and that's the favorite one for every credit person to, to speak about. That's your earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So that's a, a very important number because from there we can see, uh, you know, what is your, your repayment ability. And like any, any bookkeeper will tell you, um, uh, you, you have this, this nice look on your face when all those statements balance. So if you look at the cash flow statements, as I've said, this will only include cash transactions. So that's your, your cash versus profit. 
Uh, so the cash flow statement in the end, and I will share later, that's the, the, the most important one probably for a financial institution when you look at credit extension. In business plans, and Ahmed spoke about the business plan and your farm plan, um, I think the business plan, that's your policy statement. That's your, where you want to take the business, what you want to do with it. Um, but you know, sometimes you, you uh, compile a business plan and then you put it down in the, in the last drawer of the desk and you just leave it there. The business plan should be a live document to, that you revise regularly. Uh, to see, uh, you know, as the market changes, you, you change with that. Uh, well, with we that, you... the court order was small on Saturday, big on Sunday. Uh, yeah, so just... okay. Ahmed, please. Okay. So, if you, you know, within those business plans and your budgets, you need to set, set certain benchmarks, um, and and to do that, you obviously need to make assumptions. But uh, it's important to, to test those assumptions uh, against objective criteria and people. So speak to your neighbors, uh, speak to other farmers, uh, study groups, uh, speak to SAPA, for example, to make sure that those benchmarks make sense and it's, a, it's applicable and, and advisable. So the cash flow budget, uh, as I've said, is probably your, your most important document when you apply for finance. Um, and there you must apply the smarter concept. No, no, to be smart, the smarter concept stands for specific. So you need to set specific goals that you can measure. Um, it should be achievable. Uh, everybody wants to be a, a millionaire or a billionaire, uh, but you know, is it achievable within the, the specific context? It should also be realistic and put a time frame to that. Um, yes, I also want to be a millionaire. Uh, but do I want it to be in, in a year's time or in, in 50 years time? Um, and then more recently, the ethical thing uh, is, more, is, is coming more into place, specifically in agriculture, uh, ethical uh, practices. And then you must record. You must record everything that you do uh, and make sure that, that, that you have uh, the records available. So from, from a financial institution, our requirements, uh, if you look at, at agriculture and, and agriculture is a business, um, you will have to have financial statements with convincing evidence of affordability. So if you apply for a loan, uh, you must show the bank that it's, it's, uh, it's affordable to you and you will have repay, you, you can repay that, that, that money. And in terms of ownership, uh, the bank or any bank will never extend credit greater than a value that you own in a business. Uh, so if you own 50% of a farm and you have a, a partner, they will extend only 50, well, not more than 50%, but it's, it's, a, it's another criteria and I will show you that. But let's say you as a, as a sole prop, um, your uh, farm is, is, is a million rand uh, worth, they will not extend credit to more than that. Then, obviously, you will have, need to have sufficient assets to offer a security. Uh, we are still in a very sec security-based lending system in South Africa. Um, nowadays, banking the jockey, make sure that the person that farm, the farmer himself, has the knowledge uh, and the skills to farm um, and correctly and to make sure that he will be able to, do, to run a proper operation. Um, as I've said, yeah, uh, the skills and experience, but also, you know, if it's a new farmer coming into, into business, you know, is the willingness to, to get expert inputs where he or she is lacking? So are you willing to work with your industry organization, in this case, SAPA, to, to gain that experience and that skills? Then obviously it's important to, to match your credit to your purpose. So if you look at, at buying land, uh, or you want to, to get to fix improvements, you take out long-term loans uh, up to 15 years. We, we do 15 years in, in commercial banks. Land bank can go up to 20 years, for example. The preference, however, is to do to a 10-year to a loan uh, and, and not necessarily 15 years. 
then your, your project or your medium term loans, that's where you want to expand your production capacity. Let's say you're in the fruit, fruit business, you want to expand on some of your orchards or, do you, or you want to do livestock purchases uh, in the case of cattle and sheep. Uh, with poultry, it's a bit more difficult, but um, because of the, the lifespan of, of chickens. And then your short term finance or your production credit that's normally, we do normally do that on an overdraft facility. And that's finance that you can use for production expenses, buying feed, uh, pay electricity bills, pay your, your wages and so on. Just some credit guidelines. Uh, yeah, uh, debt, to, debt to asset ratio, 60% uh, extensive. And as I said, intensive, uh, you look at, at 60 to 70% livestock specifically and that's uh, that's more your cattle and, and sheep industry is 35 percent poultry will fall more or less in that that intensive category because of the intensive nature of of the industry so the credit policy uh, and, and i've said it a couple of times uh, you know you have to look at a repayment ability from farming operations so should you apply for an agricultural loan um, it, the, the, the repayment comes from the agricultural activities. If you earn a salary and you want to use the salary to pay for, for, for those loans, we have a product specific for that and that's called lifestyle loans. It doesn't, the name actually doesn't fit the, for the type of loan, but um, that's the, the type of loan that you can use if you're a salary, a salary person, but you want to farm on the side. In the majority ownership uh, is important. You have to have security in the, from a balance sheet, and I've mentioned the, the skills and knowledge. And then we, we have to look at term loans versus production finance. Uh, will the loan be, be to, to acquire land or to put up infrastructure, or is the loan purely for production finance? In terms of, of term loans, um, the, the, the amount of loan that will be extended will only be 60% loan to value. Uh, so the, the other 40% must come in the, by ways of a deposit. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the skin that you put into, into the game. It can go up to 70% uh, if, there's, if there's a good motivation for that. Uh, but let's say you want to buy a farm for a million rand uh, the bank will, will most probably only extend uh, 600,000 uh, credit to you for buying that land. The, there are other ways to, to um, make up the shortfall in terms of uh, life, uh, life policies and so forth, but that's a, you know, that's a, a very uh, complex structure and you need to discuss this with a banker. So the applications, um, is done through your, your business or your relationship manager. Uh, and where there is a need, the agricultural manager will also be called in uh, to make sure that the cash flow uh, makes sense and, and everything is in place. But uh, it's important to note that we don't, we don't do online applications for, for agricultural loans. Uh, it's done via the, the business or the relationship manager. And those business and relationship managers can be found uh, at your closest branch. Uh, or otherwise, I, if, you, if you don't have a branch close to you, let me know and um, we, can, we can see who's the, the applicable person in your, in your area and we can forward your request to, to him. Uh, Janine, that's uh, in short my, um, my presentation. Thank you very much, Davi. Um, again, I'm sure there's going to be a few questions for you that will come up um, now. So I'm just going to go through some of the questions that have been posted um, on the Q&A uh, tab. But um, we'll see how many we get through. Like I said before, some of them are, are somewhat repetitive as well. So um, we'll see who's going to answer what and how many we actually get through within the next, how much time do we have left? The next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so there's a lot of questions about markets. 
uh, which I think we have spoken about. Okay, so I don't know, I can't recall that the specific question was answered, but it asks specifically um, how much capital do I need to start a broiler operation? So this question was sent to us, I think, via Twitter before the webinar. Um, and I don't know if it's a question that somebody can actually answer uh, with having more specifics, but is there anyone that would like to attempt to answer that question? <laughs> that is funny. You saved me. <laughs> okay, uh, the, that question it's it's not a direct doesn't have a direct answer because it depends on what our finances look like. You do not have a specific amount, both on the broiler side and the layer side you need to first and foremost do your costing feasibility studies to know how much will it cost me to grow a hundred broilers or how much will it cost me to purchase a, a point of layer or a day old uh, layer chicks. You need to check how much that, that before you will be able, I cannot say that generally a farming cannot say bring in 15,000, 50,000 rand and start. 50,000 can start so much, but you need to also just do your costing feeding, vaccination, electricity, labor, all these things need to be put in place. Then you will know how much it will cost you to grow one chicken. Then you ask yourself, okay, can I be able to grow hundred? Can I be able to grow a thousand? It really depends on what your pocket says. Yeah. Thank you, Gladys. Um, there's also another question that says, how much space would you need for um, 30,000 layers? Um, I don't know, perhaps um, Abungile, you want to answer that in terms of um, uh, guidelines, uh, I guess. Yeah, no, we, we don't have a specific guideline, but Ahmad, can, can you give the accurate figures? Because I know you've got them. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Look, um, you, you, the preferred house to build other than a 5,000 unit house is a 20,000, 20,000 and up. So if you go free range, you will obviously have to have more houses. If you go cage, uh, eggs, cage layer, then um, it works out per, per in per cage right? So um, if you want to do 30,000, you can build a house that fits 30,000. There's no limit there. You can build a house that fits 50,000, but your house will be, your, your cages in the house will be more or stacked higher or whatever the case may be. So yeah, 30, if, if somebody wants to start, this is my advice. If you want to start layer production, start with 5,000. Two and a half thousand or five thousand. That that is how you cut your teeth in the industry because the challenges is the. You see, for us and I and I wanted to say earlier, for us detail is important. We look at I look at everything. I don't walk past nothing. I look at the color of the pool of the bird. I look at everything, <laughs> and and attention to detail is what makes you what makes you work in this industry. So whether you have two and a half thousand, five thousand, fifty thousand, if you don't pay attention and the record keeping, Davi, you must do that. You need to write down everything. And today, as the fifteenth of June, twenty twenty-three, it was raining. Write it down because next year you can plan and say in June, oh, I get a lot of rain, so I can make provision for that. This is how we are. I've got. Books and books written full of every day. Um, the day the wind was blowing, I got a phone call from Ebo to find out this. I write down everything. And you, that is how you go back to that and say, listen, this time of the year, the feed was so much and so much and so much. 
So, so it doesn't matter how many birds you have. There is cages for any, for any amount. But my thing is, start small. And if I may say one thing, Janine, please, I forgot to say. Informal yeah. markets, informal markets. People, uh, informal markets around you and around the farm. It's not info, it's markets. That people in that township has got more cash flow than me and you stays in the in the city. Because in the city, they use plastic money. In the township, they use money, money, money. So if you're there, that is your market. Don't ever look at it any other way. That is your market. You will now see, I've seen now, a shop right we can pay starting family businesses in the townships why they follow the money the money is there the, and and also um people are very finicky when it comes to eating they love chicken <laughs> they love chicken they eat everything with the chicken the egg the feed everything so you if you in this game when you're the right place you can you can make it plus the thing is you don't for myself I bought the chickens first, then I did the costing afterwards because that's that's my entrepreneurial skill, man. I think if any any entrepreneur out there will say, I'm gonna buy five chickens and see how much it works out, and then I work from there backwards. As you grow bigger, you adopt the 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 way that the costing and the what what and whatnot, because that is your experience that you've gained now. Because of the five and the ten chickens that you have. Yeah. Thank you, Ahmed. I think that's a, a good point to raise about informal markets. Um, I think a lot of people often see them as it's sort of like a dirty word, you know, you don't want to supply to the informal market, but um, that's definitely a good way to look at it. It's just a market, it's not informal for just a market. Um, and Slebo asks, um whether you believe that um free range egg production is viable in south africa is there someone who would like to answer that abungile no thanks uh, thanks janine uh, i read the comment from label uh, what is happening globally <clears throat> there's been a lot of pressure from the animal welfare lobbyist um you know, to push certain, you know, countries to consider moving from the traditional uh, cage systems. Now, if you look uh, into a South African uh, market, about 95% of our production is still under the cages. And with this uh, ongoing avian influenza, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not good to go uh, free range. Um, we still have free range in South Africa, probably at around... Uh, for percent, <clears throat> so it depends on the choice uh, and the and the and the producer. But if you've got the market, you know, for for the free range of eggs, uh, and you see demand for that, uh, there's no issue. I mean, there's no problem for you label to go for free range eggs. But uh, globally, there's that pressure that is coming from the welfare lobbyist. And in South Africa, what we have done uh, to counter that argument of the welfare lobbyist, we've done the study by the National Agricultural Marketing Council which the minister has signed recently, which we use now as an industry, as a policy guide, it appears that um, South Africa is not ready, you know, to consider a full 100% cage free systems. Why? Because one of our biggest concerns in South Africa at the moment is food security more than other thing. Um, and also it, the cost that we, it will cost government to, to transition from the current 95% uh, cages to a total uh, cage free system. We will require around uh, five billion um, to invest, and now the question is, who's gonna, uh, you know, uh, subsidize that investment, government or the industry or the consumer? So uh, that is the situation with this issue of the cage-free story. But uh, the choice is yours, Levo. Uh, if you see demand and you see uh, people requesting uh, free-range eggs, well, uh, we as SAPA we're not against uh, free-range eggs. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the free range egg producers are part of uh, SAPA. Thank you. Janine, can I say something on that, please? Yeah, sure. Look, it's a simple thing, man. 
the free range and the cage free. It's affordability, man. If I send my wife down to spa to buy a cabbage, let's take a cabbage for that. And she can get two cabbages for 20 rand. But then the free range cabbage, 35 rand. And then she comes home with that 35 rand cabbage, then she will find her someplace else to stay. Because it's about affordability. Free range eggs, if you see how much effort and people put into this and everybody says my, my one of my sons who don't stay in the farm said no that that i buy free range he said, yeah you can you got a nice job but when you come here you eat your mother's cake cage eggs there's nothing wrong it's the same thing it's just how the birds are read i would much rather put an affordable egg into the market than a free range egg. that's 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 where we come from Uh, sorry, Gladys, was your hand up? It was it was up earlier on, but I I think we can pass it. It's just about the thirty thousand capacity. What space do you need? I wanted to uh, put more highlight on that, but we can move on to that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mohammed asks about um, indigenous poultry breeds, um, and if there's any formal market for the eggs or meat of these types of chickens in South Africa. Does anyone want to attempt to answer that one? What is, what is the question, mm -hmm. Jimmy? Uh, so he asks um, about indigenous poultry breeds and whether there's any <clears throat> formal market for the eggs or meat of these types of chickens in South Africa. Yeah. Janine, maybe let me try and answer that. Um, if we talk from a broiler perspective, um, we do have indigenous breeds um, in, in the country. Now we must understand what they stand for. Now, typically, the indigenous breed will uh, take a longer time to grow, and therefore, um, the bird will have less fat, and it will have more texture in the muscles. Um, and that is typically sold as a hard body bird um, in South Africa, or a, a whole bird, um, or a live bird um, in South Africa. So there's very definitely a market like that. Um, there's also been a number of people that actually uh, looked at slow growing birds um, for the South African market. Now, that particular market, the market that, that, that consumes the indigenous breeds, don't want the very soft um, broilers that we produce in general. They are they after a very specific taste. So, um, um, in my opinion, there is a market for, for the indigenous breed in South Africa as a broiler. Okay, there's another question about with regarding to breeds. Um, just what I guess we can expand the question a bit and just say, in your opinion, what is the best breed for broiler production and what is the best breed for egg production? Let me start with a with a broiler answer. Um, we have really only two breeds, two commercial breeds left in the world. Um, it is basically the Ross and Arbor Eiko, the Avergen product and the Cobb product. So those are really the only two left. And those are um, fast growing breeds. They're very effective. They've got very good uh, feed conversion ratios. Um, and, and, and those are the breeds that one um, would go for first or go to first. Um, those would be the breeds that's going to give you the most efficient production process and therefore hopefully make um, the most money. Except if you've got a niche market, as we've discussed, uh, with the indigenous breeds um, that, that you have. And, and my proposal to a farmer um, will also be firstly to look at um, the commercial breeds like Ross and Cobb um, before you look at any other breed because certainly um, those are the breeds that, that were designed 
uh, to make money from. Yeah, just to to add uh, to Isaac, uh, uh, yeah, we 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 the same with the broilers on the X side. We've got three breeds uh, uh, that are, are recognized in our space, and those are the three breeds that you'll find in the market. So I wouldn't say uh, one breed is better than the other one, but those are the three breeds uh, that one can can take use of. Thanks. Um, and then there's a, also an interesting question about making your own feed. Is that a um, viable um, option for for smallholder farmers? Um, in terms of, uh, let me try and answer. In terms of um, feed manufacturing, is a very scientific process. Um, we will add, if you manufacture feed, you will typically use a maize and soya and fish meal and um, sunflower oil cake. And then you'll add vitamins and minerals um, uh, to that. You'll add a coccidiostat, you'll add a growth promoter. So this is sophisticated work. Um, and we don't find in, in, in South Africa or even in Africa, rest of Africa, um, where there are small farmers that they tend to do to do this um, or to do their own feed or mix their own feed. It's certainly something that's going to increase your risk substantially because if you get your feed wrong, you're going to pay dearly. But um, what I've seen in countries like Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, is that people buy, um, they call it a concentrate. Um, so that will be the protein side of the diet. Um, so you will buy the concentrate and the concentrate will include the vitamins, minerals, coccidiostat and growth stimulant already. And what they then do is they will take that concentrate and mix it with their own maize. And, um, and that really works well. So you will find um, an awful amount of feed mills like that where they own mix by simply adding, um, for example, two bags of concentrate and then their own maize. Typically, the farmers want to utilize their own maize. And then they will add, for example, eight, eight uh, bags of, of their own maize. And that certainly is halfway between a formal um, feed producer and home mixing. And I think that is a viable option um, for a farmer um, if you've got a, a mixing bin um, and, and you can do that. Yes, to also add to that, for small-scale farmers, I wouldn't advise it. Then no matter how expensive it is outside there, with good management, because everything that we do, it's all about management. With good management, you will make a certain amount of profit out of your business. So before you start thinking about producing your own feed or mixing your own feed, to get the ingredients, just like here, say, to get the, in, like uh, as Isaac has said, to get the ingredients, you will go from here to there to be able to get it correctly. And once you miss it, you are in for a big loss. So concentrate, buy, manage well until you get to that point where you will have even the, the nutritionalist in your farm to produce your feed for you. Thank you. Thank you. So Gladys, I was told I keep on missing you putting your hand up. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, I think, yeah, so we only have about two minutes left. So perhaps if anyone wants to share um, just sort of their final thoughts about um, poultry industry in South Africa or anything that relates to what was spoken about today. Um, Ahmed, let's stop with you. Thank you, Janine. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. My message is quite simple to small farmers. Go out there, make it happen. Uh, you need to start small. How small? You determine that that's your, your pocket size. But there's a couple of things you need to know. Feed, don't compromise on feed. Get markets first. There's a lot of markets out there. You just need to search for that market. Get your markets. Don't compromise on feed. And don't be shy. Don't say, okay, Ahmad sells his eggs for so much, I'm going to cut this. No, no, charge your price for the eggs. They will come back. Believe you me, they will come back. Once they taste the 
if you eat the fresh egg, you won't eat the other egg in it. That's the, the only thing. So go and, and the market is on your doorstep and make it happen. And if there's anything you need and we can help, we want to help anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Abongile. No, thanks, uh, thanks, Jane. Um, to to the audience, I would like to encourage those of you who are farmers um, to pay the levies that are collected by SAPA through the uh, food safety. I mean, the, through the red meaty levy administrators. Now, I'll tell you why I'm encouraging you to pay those levies. You pay less than uh, two cents per dozen, and one of the conditions that we have from government when we collect those levies is to do transformation. Use twenty percent of the money that we collect towards transformation. And I'm proud to announce to you that uh, as from the 1st of uh, July, SAPA will be launching a scheme called Amakip Keep, uh, using those uh, you know levies, 20% from those levies. This Amakip Keep, it's a small soft loans that we'll be giving our uh, members or those who will be knocking at SAPA with a capacity of below 5,000 beds. Uh, the, the loan has got um, a portion of a grant, around 25% of it is a grant, and uh, it's interest-free um, to the producer. So please, I encourage you, even if you produce, uh, you've got 100 chickens, pay the levy. It will help others and even yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Abongile. Gladys. My advice to farmers is this. The cheaper, the more expensive it is for you. Don't go out looking for the cheapest commodity. There you would realize you will spend more, getting them more expensive. Do not compromise, just like Ahmed said. So whatever price it is, manage the price. Do not go for the cheaper product. And it is doable. Both, both, the, both the ladies, the youth, the older one, it is doable. So go out there and do it, or let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Isak. I think uh, uh, some advice that I can give to prospective um, farmers would be that when they want to buy dial chicks or they want to buy point of laid birds or they want to buy feed or equipment, is to check on the, the registered um, suppliers of that on the SAPA website. We often get complaints from small farmers that they've been taken by rogue people in the industry. So if you want to be safe, um, go. There's a list of everyone that belongs to SAPA and, uh, and, and uh, the equipment suppliers, feed suppliers, whatever. That should make you um, comfortable that you're, you won't be um, losing your money. Thank you, Isak. And then Gabi. Thanks, Janine. Yeah, I think uh, advice uh, from my side, um, you know, go and uh, go and look for those opportunities, uh, get those business plans in place. And you know, it's, always, it's always easier to approach your current bank because they have a record of you on, 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 on record uh, of all your transactions and everything. So it's always better to speak to your current bank first um, to for, for assistance and then secondly you know there are uh, enterprise development loans available uh, where we where we uh, subsidize the interest for example we work through the CIFA and Kula funds and also in certain cases jobs funds um, so so that is possible but uh, it's not it's not always easy but please uh, please keep knocking on those doors uh, to, to get it to that uh, credit applications. Thank you so much. I see there's quite a few questions that we didn't get to, but um, please send us those questions on um, Twitter or any of our social media and we'll try and answer them. Um, I would just like to thank our panelists today for giving us their time and their knowledge and expertise on the poultry industry. Um, I hope that we have addressed some of your, your questions, at least some of your concerns. Um, and we hope to also have another poultry webinar very soon, because this is something that a lot of people are 
are very interested in. So thank you very, very much to our panelists. This would not have been possible without you. We really appreciate it. And then finally, thank you to all the attendees. Thank you for being patient with us that we had to cancel at the last minute last week. Um, and we're very happy to have had you join us. So until next time, um, happy farming. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.